What if I told you that some of the places uh, with the lowest rates of kidney cancer in the U.S. are also the places with the highest? You might think I'm pulling your leg, but it's true. We're talking about those rural, sparsely populated counties, often in Republican-leaning states. This seems paradoxical. You might picture clean air less stress and think those factors explain the lower rates. But how can those same characteristics also be linked to higher rates? The answer lies in understanding a tricky little statistical concept, the law of small numbers. And this entire deep dive is all about helping you understand why sometimes those eye-catching statistics can be totally misleading. Let's unpack this with the kidney cancer example. The reason both high A and D low kidney cancer rates show up in these rural counties is simply because they have smaller populations. Think of it like drawing marbles from a jar. If the jar has equal red and white marbles, someone grabbing a handful is more likely to get a mix close to 50-50, but someone drawing only two marbles, they have a much higher chance of getting either all red or all white. It's the same idea with these counties. Sparsely populated areas are like those drawing just a few marbles. The results are more prone to extremes just by chance. It doesn't mean there are NO environmental factors at play, but those extremes are more likely a statistical quirk than anything unique to those counties themselves. This tendency to seek a cause when something is actually due to the law of small numbers, that's called the small numbers fallacy. And it trips us up all the time. Our brains love finding patterns and making connections, so we easily overlook the role of pure chance. And here's where it gets really interesting. This isn't just some abstract statistical concept. The small numbers fallacy can have real-world consequences, especially when it comes to big decisions. Take the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example. They invested a whopping $1.7 billion in education reform based on research showing that smaller schools perform better. However, that research overlooked a crucial detail. The worst performing schools were also often smaller. It turns out the link between school size and success was likely just a statistical artifact, not a genuine cause and effect relationship. Failing to consider this fallacy cost them big time. It highlights how important it is to be critical of statistical claims, especially those based on smaller samples. Just because a study finds something doesn't mean it's the whole picture. This fallacy can pop up anywhere, you know, not just in big picture things like national cancer rates or education reform. It affects how we interpret trends in everyday life, too. Think about those moments when you form an opinion about a whole group of people based on just a few encounters. Maybe you meet a couple of folks from a certain country who are super friendly and you think everyone from there must be so outgoing. But hold on. Your experience, while totally valid, is just a tiny snapshot. It's like judging a whole jar of marbles based on pulling out only two. There's a whole spectrum of personalities in any group, and it's unlikely your limited interactions captured the full range. This tendency to overgeneralize from small samples is where stereotypes and biases take root. It's why it's so important to constantly check ourselves. Is this sample truly representative? Is the data I'm looking at or the experience I'm basing my judgment on enough to draw a solid conclusion? If not, we need to be careful about making sweeping statements. Look for more data, consider different viewpoints, and be open to the possibility that our initial impressions might be way off. Now let's zoom in on an area where statistics are king, medical research. You often hear about studies finding links between certain behaviors and health outcomes. But sometimes these findings can be misleading, especially if they're based on small samples. Imagine a study says people who eat blueberries have a lower risk of heart disease. Sounds great, right? But what if that study only looked at 100 people? It's entirely possible that result is just a fluke, a statistical blip due to the small sample size. To be more confident, we need to see similar results in bigger, more diverse studies. This applies to any health claim. It's crucial to look at the study design, the sample size, and whether the findings have been replicated before making any big lifestyle changes based on that information. Don't just accept headlines at face value. Dig a little deeper, question the source, and consider whether the small numbers fallacy might be lurking behind those attention-grabbing stats. Remember, even when a study has a large sample size, how that sample was selected matters. Was it truly random, or was there some built-in bias that might have skewed the results? This is where the idea of a representative sample comes in. It needs to accurately reflect the characteristics of the larger population it's supposed to represent. If the sample is off, say it over-represents one group or excludes others, the findings might not apply to the wider population. Let's say a study on a new weight loss drug only includes participants who are young and healthy. The drug might work great for them, but that doesn't mean it'll be effective for older folks or those with pre-existing conditions. So sample size is important, but it's not the only factor. We also need to pay attention to sample selection and how well it represents the group we're interested in. Now you might be thinking, 
If this fallacy is everywhere, how can I trust any statistics? It's not about becoming cynical or distrusting all data. It's about being a more informed and discerning consumer of information. It's about understanding the limitations of statistics and recognizing that even the most rigorous research can have biases and quirks. The key is to develop those critical thinking skills and approach information with a healthy dose of skepticism. Don't be afraid to ask questions, seek out different perspectives, and look beyond the surface level to understand the nuances and potential pitfalls. Getting familiar with some basic statistical concepts can help too. You don't need to be a statistician, but understanding things like sample size, statistical significance, and margins of error gives you a better grasp of how to interpret research findings and evaluate the strength of evidence. And here's another thing. The way information is presented can be misleading. Headlines in news articles often focus on the most sensational or attention-grabbing aspects of a study which might not accurately reflect the overall findings or the limitations of the research. Always try to go back to the original source, the actual research paper or a report, to get a more complete and nuanced understanding of what the data truly shows. Now let's dive into how this fallacy can distort our perceptions of success and failure, especially in fields like business and investing. We often hear stories about overnight entrepreneurial success or investors striking it rich with a risky bet. These stories are captivating, but they create a skewed sense of how success usually happens. In reality, most successful ventures, whether it's a startup or an investment strategy, involve a lot of trial and error setbacks and lessons learned along the way. The stories we hear often skip over the countless failures and adjustments that pave the way to that success. This can create a dangerous illusion, making people think success is all about taking huge risks and getting lucky. But that's not a sustainable strategy. It's more like gambling than informed decision-making. The small numbers fallacy can also make us um, overestimate the skill of those who achieve early success. We might attribute their wins to some innate talent or genius, forgetting that chance played a role and that many others who tried the same thing might have failed. This is especially common in the investing world. You hear about someone making a killing on a certain stock and you think they must have some secret knowledge. But it's important to remember that investment returns are influenced by market swings and all sorts of factors beyond anyone's control. Someone might get lucky and score big in a short time, but that doesn't mean they're a market guru or that their strategy will keep working long term. Studies even show that past performance is a poor predictor of future returns, particularly with individual stocks or actively managed funds. It's more like flipping a coin than having a guaranteed recipe for success. So how do we avoid falling for the small numbers fallacy when it comes to judging success and failure? First, take the long view. Don't get caught up in short-term ups and downs or anecdotal evidence. Focus on building a solid foundation based on sound principles and a diversified approach. Second, be skeptical of anyone claiming a guaranteed formula for success, especially if they're basing it on limited data or personal stories. True success usually comes from hard work persistence and learning from mistakes. And finally, don't be afraid to question your own assumptions and biases. We all tend to see patterns where they don't exist or overestimate our abilities. By being more self-aware and critical of our own thinking, we can make smarter choices and avoid costly blunders. Now let's explore how this fallacy can warp our perceptions of risk and safety. We often judge the safety of an activity or location based on limited information or anecdotes. Let's say you hear about a few car accidents on a certain stretch of highway. You might start thinking, that road must be dangerous. But it's crucial to get some perspective. How many cars use that road daily without incident? What are the overall accident rates for that road compared to others in the area? Without that context, it's easy to overestimate the risk. You might avoid it altogether, even if it's statistically no more dangerous than any other road. It's the same with air travel. A major plane crash makes headlines and triggers anxiety among travelers. But statistically, air travel remains one of the safest ways to get around. The risk of dying in a plane crash is incredibly low, much lower than in a car accident. But because plane crashes are so rare and so catastrophic when they do happen, they stick in our minds and distort our perception of risk. We might fear flying, even though it's statistically safer than driving. The small numbers fallacy can also make us underestimate risks associated with things that feel safe or familiar. Say you've driven the same route to work for years without a problem. It's easy to become complacent and take that safety for granted. You might start driving faster, paying less attention, or doing other risky things thinking. It's never been an issue before. But that's a dangerous mindset. Accidents can happen anytime, and even a small lapse in judgment or attention can have serious consequences. So how do we prevent the small numbers fallacy from warping our sense of risk and safety? 
First, gather as much information as you can from reliable sources. Don't rely solely on anecdotes or personal experiences. Look at statistics, research reports, and expert opinions for a more objective view. Second, put risks into perspective. Don't fixate only on the potential downsides. Also consider how likely those downsides are and the potential benefits of the activity. For example, the risk of a serious side effect from a vaccine is incredibly low, far lower than the risk of getting the disease it prevents. Third, don't let fear or anxiety control your decisions. It's natural to feel anxious about things perceived as dangerous, but don't let those emotions cloud your judgment. Make decisions based on facts and a rational assessment of risk, not fear or speculation. And lastly, remember that risk is a part of life. We can't eliminate all risks, but we can manage them by being informed, making smart choices, and taking reasonable precautions. The small numbers fallacy can be a powerful force shaping our views on risk success and even the world around us. But by understanding how it works and honing our critical thinking skills, we can make better choices, avoid common traps, and navigate life's complexities with greater clarity and confidence. So the next time you encounter a statistic that seems too good or bad to be true, remember to consider. Could the small numbers fallacy be at play?